Tell you. Cord. You got it. Where's our staff announcer? Where's our staff announcer? And we are live. <laughs> Good morning, New York, Vinny. How are you? And how are you and how are your dancing sandwiches? Oh, uh, you know, Mikey, I am okay up here in Seattle. It's it's raining. It's flooding. And the old man is humping. I don't know. It's... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. The old man is... is Humping. Lucky, lucky Venus is humping out there. Lucky Venus is humping in the home. <laughs> it could be a hit. I was humping in the home, baby. <laughs> well, it rained here for uh, half an hour a couple of days ago, and it startled the entire southern part of the state of California. We weren't quite certain what that was. Perhaps we were being invaded by some tiny little objects that were flying through the air, but it turned out to be rain. I, I saw Jimmy Kimmel talking about it, and um, he seemed to be uh, he was he was befuddled and shocked that you know people showed up in galoshes and <laughs> raincoats and uh, fishing they brought, hats. And, they brought pickle boats and inflatable dinghies. I, I think I've only been in L.A. twice when it's rained, and it is a sight to behold, man. And and this was in the in the in the 70s and the 80s uh so i could remember i could only imagine what it must be now when well, uh n now i swear to god on a freeway here's here's what it's like on a sunny day one day a week Kristen and i drive from pasadena all the way to woodland hills it's about a 40 minute tool on three different freeways and every day in the middle of the day with the sun shining, a car will do this, come up behind you, mm, around you, change lanes in front of you, change lanes again, change lanes up there. And then after changing lanes three times and speeding and endangering everyone around him to the, to the count of like 30 cars on the freeway, he just disappears into the action and gets away with it. And it's not once, but it's every day that you see. And sometimes it'll be a truck. Sometimes it'll be a little car. Sometimes it'll be a Tesla. You can't figure out who it's going to be. You don't know. You can't profile them, but they're out there. Now, that driver is not going to adjust his idiotic approach to driving just because it's raining. Right. And that's where you get your real problems. I, I, I vaguely remember, and, and you probably was down there more than me, but... Uh, obviously, but I think it was in the seventies. Had it be like the the, the middle seventies, like 75, 76, something like that. I remember I, had a, I was in LA, my brother and I, I had a rat trap car that I had driven from New York. It was a station wagon, a, a Dodge station wagon. It made and it. Driven it out from New York, slept in it. I mean, these people with the van life thing, they think they started that. My brother and I were doing van life. We called <laughs> it station wagon life, sleeping in rest stops and, you know, washing up in bed. You know, that's how we traveled. We didn't have any money. But I remember going down at, uh, going down sun, was it Sunset? Yeah, sunset, you know where the curve is, where it kind of curves around as you start to go down to the beach? Yes. That did not have the rain. You know, nowadays the pavement is grooved. Oh. And so, you know, tires stick to it, groove against groove, they kind of stick to it. But in those days, it wasn't grooved. And I remember coming down in the car, man, and I'm in the, you know, it's like three lanes. So I'm in the left lane and I'm coming you know, again, I got a rat trap car, but still it's a, it's decent. It goes across country. And I, I'm coming down the curve and I started in the left lane. And by the time I got through the curve, I was in the right lane. <laughs> Just slid over. I what, was is like, it, what is it? You're a car authority. What is it in the fuel of the of America that causes the streets to get slick in LA after it hasn't rained for a long time? What is oil. it? Just oil product. Oil comes oil, you know, cars run on grease and oil i mean it's there's so much lubrication in a um in a, a a gasoline engine car that either the oil leaks or the um uh, grease that's used to um uh, the, the grease the fittings and everything or the rear end or so many other components that have to be oiled over time and heat see the heat breaks down the oil and then the oil expands 
and it comes out of the joints, which are rubber. And little particles of it fall to the pavement. Millions of particles of exhaust and oil products. Well, exhaust, I, I don't know how much exhaust plays into it because that's carbon and that's a bit different. And I'm sure that tires, because tires wear and they leave a compound uh, of the tire on the pavement. So in the water, I mean, you know what happens when you have oil and water together. They don't like each other. They don't like each, gonna... Well, they may like each other, but they don't hang out with each other too well. No. You know, they, 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 you know now it's going to be interesting to see with electric cars, as they become more popular, if that problem will, um, over time, it has take to, care of itself. It has to lessen. Yeah, it does. You know, because you're not, you don't have the oil. You don't have, I mean, you have some of it. You're going to have some lubrication, of course, in the uh, joints, but you're not going to have the um, oil pan with five quarts of 10W30 in it, uh, you know, slowly leaking around the gaskets. Now, I don't know what they're using to cool some of these. Uh, it's probably an interesting question, but I think that over it, whatever it is, it's going to be less than what they're using now. Because that's the whole point of the electric car, to use less oil. Now, what Not about just Seattle? In gasoline, but in lubricants do around Seattle, the car as well. Do, do Seattle streets, because they get more rain, are they easier to drive when it does rain? Or does it first rain of the season? Well, really get good? I think it's the experience, Michael, more than anything else. I mean, I, probably as, yeah, because the streets do eventually the oil, the layer, the thin layer of oil does eventually get washed and worn off to the side but if you have a situation like you have in la i'm thinking what was it the last rain in march right i think or something like that well it was actually last month but it was just one day yeah oh, okay a so, so maybe a little bit better that means one hour a long extended period no not a full day is rain for for months right all you know it it um it builds up so now you have instead of having this little layer now you have maybe a layer like that, and it has to break down. Now, the heat of the tires going over it, I would think, I, I'm not a, a, a scientist or anything here, um, but I would think that it breaks it down and moves it off to the side. And that's why when you see rainwater going down into your sewers to go back into your drinking water, it has that nice little sheen of oil on it. If you ever look at rainwater, look at it, you'll see like a, a little sheen or a little almost rainbow looking thing on top of it. And you'll see the, the, the oil that's on the pavement being washed into the sewers. The safest advice that uh, Washington troopers give to people through the winter is drive for conditions. It, and that's actually professional advice, but what the average driver doesn't know is what the conditions truly are. I can see where I'm going. It may be icy, but I can see what's happening around here. I can go 50. I can go 60. Yes, you can go 60. Can you stop? Can you adjust? Can you maneuver? Chances are you can't. Well, yeah. And, and I mean, now at least they have these, you know, the huge signboards up and so on and so forth to tell you to slow down. I don't, you know, listen, the majority of people slow down. Yeah. Nine out of 10 people slow down, but there's always going to be that idiot that's driving their car up over the pass and they yep. think, oh, I got a four wheel drive. Here I come. So I can go through anything. I bought oh, these man. big Gunda tires <laughs> and I've got a huge pickup truck and I can just fly by with the diesel fuel going and the smoke going and everything at 90 miles an hour. Or, you know, listen, I, I, I unfairly say that because. I've seen people in Subarus with kids peeking out the back window doing the same thing. Going, you know, you're you're in the middle lane and you're going up the pass and you're being cautious. You know, you're going at at 60, which is probably even still too yeah. much for road conditions. But yes. you know, I'm a, I, I would call myself a fairly experienced driver. If I get into a mess, I pretty much know what to do. Uh, and if I I can't get out of it, I've been too stupid for my own good. Yeah, but you'll always see that car flying by you on the left, and um, and invariably they have Jacunda tires. 
Well, not not invariably, because I mean, on the pickup trucks, you see them, but on the family sedans, you know, or a Subaru or a, you know, a Volkswagen or something like that. It's just people who feel like they're empowered <laughs> by four wheel drive. You know, um, they just feel like and they, they believe the commercials which show them, you know, motoring through anything when you have four wheel drive. It, it, it helps you. But it doesn't stop the car. It doesn't prevent the car from skidding on a piece of ice. The only thing it does, it gives you two extra wheels of traction. But if you're flying along at 60 or 70 miles an hour in a snowstorm, you hit the brake, it's going to look back at you and go, <laughs> Nope, not happening. And you can you have any- all of the anti-lock braking stuff in the world. That's the best example that you've made in some time of the American way. American drivers, every once in a while, there's one example. Your, your guy going 70 in the snow is an example of the American way where his privileged attitude toward the rest of the world has got him and those around him in trouble. And he knows it maybe somewhere down his brainstem, but he's ignoring it because he feels like an American can get away with this. Very true. Very true. We, um, the American way, and by the way, for those of you who may just be listening today, all week we've been doing truth, justice, and the American way uh, leading up to the election next week. Which comes from where? What's different about those now, uh, as they were when those words were first uttered in the opening of the Superman TV series back in 1950, when truth, justice, and the American way were three very and completely different things than we see today in many cases seem it seems so simple in 1950 it seems so straightforward and simple and now it seems almost impossible to put your finger on the american way or to find the elements of the american way and say yeah that's the kind of life i want to live that's the kind of thought i want to have that's the kind of belief i want my children to to instill in their children well, let's think back to, to, to for a second, because you can only understand where you are if you know where you were, right? Where uh, was I? Where was I? Where was I? You know, in 1950, 51, when Superman premiered, we were coming off the jag of World War II, which uh, showed us as the superior country, the, 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 the best country in the world. We had defeated uh, Nazi Germany and Japan, two people who were trying to take over everybody. Um, We had uh, industry was clicking along at all these GIs with cash in their pockets who came back from uh, the world wars, uh, looking to get a piece of what was sold to us then or sold to people. And I wasn't around until 55 as the American dream. And the American dream was uh, a house, a car, um, three squares a day, Two kids. Um, if you got sick, you went to a hospital. It was run by more than likely the Catholic Church. You went to Saint Eligius or Saint Barnabas. Saint Eligius. Who was Saint Eligius? <laughs> crying out tears. I've heard of a lot of saints, but I never heard of Saint Eligius. What did he do? You know who's it? You don't know what Saint Eligius is? No, it was he. It was he the hospital in the Saint Elsewhere. Oh, okay. remember the TV show Saint Elsewhere? Yeah. Yeah, they were, it's in I Allegiance guess I guess not very well, or I would have known that. It, 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 exactly. So um, you know, yes, yeah, Saint Allegius. Um and you know, but but so the American churches. the American way is really rooted in the American dream. You have to achieve the dream, which is something you can't really put your fingers on. And after you've got the dream taken care of, you can join in and be part of the American way. Well, also banks decided that it would be a good idea for them. And that they could get a piece of their American dream, which was to make a lot of money, by simply saying to people, okay, we have all of this money, and you want a house. So we will lend you um, $15,000 to buy your house at a, a certain interest rate, and you'll pay us back, and we'll make money. And if we do that 50 million times... We'll make a lot of money. A lot of money in our pockets. AP Giannini's kids were not stupid. They knew how to, you know, and then they and then they said, well, this works so well with houses. 
now we should probably do it with cars. And, you know, the old days you used to have to save up, you know, and I'm talking about old days, you know, in the 30s, in the 40s, 20s, 30s, 40s. If you wanted a car, you saved up, you went to the dealer, you handed them 600 bucks, and they let you drive out in a new Ford. But the idea of payments before that time was you want to buy the car at $600. Well, what about yeah. payments? Payments, yeah, there's a payment. You pay me $600. Right, you pay me $600 and I'll give you the car. I got, I got 20 of them sitting here. But at that point, now we came up with the installment plan. And so the part about having instant gratification, which is get it now, as opposed to save for it and wait, which was the American way right? up until that, now turned into you want it, go down, sign a piece of paper, they'll give it to you, and then you pay a little bit of your paycheck every month. Worry about it later. And, and worry about it later. And General Motors, it wasn't it General Motors or was it Ford that came up with the idea of if we're going to sell them cars, why don't we do the financing? I believe that was General Motors, General Motors Acceptance Corporation, GMAC. And GMAC put, you know, were put loans out there and said, wait a minute, you're going to go buy a Chevrolet. You got the cash for that. Let me show you this Buick. It has shiny <laughs> knobs. It has two-tone paint. It has nice chrome around it. And instead of giving me uh, yeah, $2,500 for this Chevy, why don't we just make your payment of $32 a month over the next two years or whatever it was, three years, uh, $132 a month. And we'll put you in this Buick and your people on the block will look at you and say, there's a man of distinction. He's driving a Buick. And then when you take the Buick back to trade it in, the guy from Cadillac says to you, wait a second, let's put you in this thing. So it's $232 a month. But man, are the people on your block going to look at you and say, there's a successful man. And in that worked. That actually worked. Yeah. Oh, it totally worked. It totally worked. And so that was the American way. That's that's how it had changed in the 50s. By the time 59, 60 came around, you know. When I was a kid, by the time 59, 60 came around, the American way now was not to pay with cash, but to buy it on the installment plan. You needed a refrigerator. You went down to the GE acceptance company. You needed a uh, an oven. You wanted to buy, a, you know, redo your house. You want to a beneficial. We're good for more a beneficial, you know, or HFC. <laughs> Vinny, you know, knows how, Vinny knows so many jingles and he can sing them. He doesn't just say, do you remember the dancing sandwiches? No, he sings you the jingle. It's, uh, it, you know, but but that's what happened is that now you had household finance and you had this and you had that. The only the only time people ever bought on credit that much, I, I believe, if they were buying like a wedding ring or something like that, that was so far beyond, you know, their um, means. Uh, to to aggregate the money in one lump sum, but and then, and then speaking of the Giannini family, they came up with the thing called the Bank America card. That that turned out to be why don't we why don't we just make this easy? Why fill out all this paperwork? No 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 no. Use the card. We'll carry it. Don't you worry. Twenty three percent. What are you worried about? We're paying for it. Just catch up with your payments. It'll be cool. But there is a slight service fee. There are handling right. fees. We're going to throw 5% on because we like you. We like you so much that we want you to get a, this, the gold Bank America card. Now. That changed, that changed of, the dream right away. Right. Now, instead of living within your means, you didn't have to live within your means. You could put it on a credit card. And it took a while, but we transitioned to a society that says, I don't have to have the money. I think part of it, Mikey, was rooted in the fact that in many people in the 50s and 60s thought that we weren't going to be here in the 70s, that either Russia or us was going to hit the, the trigger for the bomb and blow us all up. 
and that we wouldn't have, and that we, 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 you know, that, that we wanted this gratification now. We wanted to take our kids to Disneyland now. We didn't want to wait until Disneyland was a smoldering ruin in Southern California. We had been so fed the bomb stuff from, you know, from everybody, from our teachers, duck and cover, right on through to uh, the nightly news, to everything. So that we, we almost now grew up with this, I got to have it now, this instant gratification. It, was, it might have been part of that drive in us, Vinny, that got us so messed up in Vietnam, which was a turning point. The American dream and the American way sort of converged there. We were dreaming that we could take care of this in our own way. And our ego that showed us the American way was the right way said, just let us get in there and we'll chase them out. And it'll take probably two weeks. You notice the way we always estimate how long our wars are going to last. We're going yep. into Iran and Iraq and we're going to invade Kuwait before that. How much do you think that's going to cost us? The cost I can't tell you about, but we're only going to be there for a couple months. And then we'll be gone. We'll be gone. It'll be, it'll be taken care of the American way. Right. And meanwhile, to keep that American way going, which was now cars and suburbia and houses, you had to have more of what? Oil, energy. Oh, yeah. So what did you do? Said, well, it's not enough in Pennsylvania. And it's not enough in Texas. And there's not enough uh, out in um, El Segundo. I think that's where the oil wells are, right, El Segundo? Signal Hill. Yeah. Hence what the Signal Oil Company. That's right. Um, that's right. So now we had to figure out, okay, well, what are we going to do? Well, we went over to the Arabs who had all the, all the oil they could possibly want. They, but they didn't even have a ship to ship it anywhere. But they had nothing. So here, yeah, listen, we have all these uh, Navy tankers that we were using to you know, uh, bring fuel to our troops where we can load those up and bring your oil here and give you, you know, a nickel a gallon for it. You know, and these people are out there and, uh, you know, they don't have TVs or anything. They're just, they're living the life that they were living in 1651. And later, not now, but in a couple of years, you can have as many princes in the royal family as you want. How many princes do you need? Five hundred, six hundred. a lot of money. Everybody's a, a lot of a lot of people are princes in Saudi Arabia, and they're driving nice cars and living in a nice house, and they wear totally white. And of course, the oil companies made sure that governments in those companies remain in those countries remain friendly to us. That was the American way, just like we did in South. We figured it worked in South America. Why wouldn't it work in in Arabia? These are just a bunch of dumb people. They don't know what the what the world is like over here. I think part of our attitude toward the uh, the Arab nations, and given the fact that they had the oil and we were the ones who were going to show him how to uh, how to make a profit with it, sort of turned on us eventually. And that's that that was the corporate rule throughout America for a long time. <clears throat> corporation is going to make some decisions that are a little uncomfortable for the American way and the American dream. But the corporation has the corporation's best interest at heart, and that's why what's happening today with Elon Musk has happened through through our corporate history, whether it be broadcasting or oil or real estate, we eat our own. Yeah. The company becomes more important than the customer, than the profit, than the whole element of the exchange, whether it's real estate or oil. The customer becomes secondary. You need them to fuel the machine of profit but you're making decisions that even the customer won't like. And you, what you really want is for the customer not to be in a position to do anything about it. Right, right. And the American way that we thought was a person has a vote. You vote with your feet. You vote with your pocketbook. You vote with this. You vote with that. <laughs> um, Don't vote with that. No, well, sometimes you got to vote with that. Um, all of a sudden now, you're... You turn, and there's two other factors that come in at that time, too. And that is rock and roll. Rock and roll was good. Which now separates. Well, there's three other factors, really, if you think about it, that changed the American way. The American way in 1950 was 
black people stay in their neighborhoods. There are none. There are no yeah. black people. You can't find them. You don't know where they are. Where well, do they not live? If you watch television. I mean, there's yeah. black people, you know, because that's the neighborhood that your parents tell you, don't go walking through. Don't go there. The darkies will get you. Um, and you start to see that. You see urban flight and black people coming up from the South looking for jobs. Remember, this is still less than 100 years. Muddy Waters was still in Mississippi. Yeah, where where uh, the slaves were free and, and, and all of that stuff. And so now the uh, immigrant sons of immigrants and still immigrants that have come over in the early part of the century are saying, I don't want to live with black people. I've been told all my life they're bad. I'm moving. I'm moving to Levittown. I'm moving to Syosset. I'm moving to uh, upstate New York. I'm moving here. I'm moving there. I'm getting out of the city. And by the time the middle 50s roll around, what happens is that in many inner cities, uh, the white Americans, the American way, is now filled with black Americans which in no way in 1950 are the American way. A black man is still a sight to see. They've just been playing baseball for three years. And there's a lot of people that aren't hip to that idea. You didn't see any commercial that showed a black person and a white person the American way was white baseball. The American dream was just that white baseball. Like neighborhoods. Yeah. So anyway, that's kind of where the American dream was. And, and by the way, the other two things, you had rock and roll, you had integration, and you had the biggest thing of all, it changed the American way, television. Television took you now from having to go out and go down to the store and talk to people on a face-to-face -face basis. You know, there, there used to be a social media in this country way before Twitter and Facebook. It was called, go down and get me a paper. <laughs> and your old man at seven o'clock at night would give you a quarter. Uh, well, no, at that time it was a nickel. And tell you, go down to, run down to the candy store and get me a paper. Well, what was it? What was it? What was the evening paper that he read? Uh, the Daily News came up at usually about 8 o'clock at night. And, um, and, and uh, I think the Mirror came up at night, too, the first edition of the Mirror. Uh, was, it, was that the Bulldog edition, I think? If it, yeah. had red, if it had red stars, it was the Bulldog. Yeah, yeah. It was the, it, it was, and that was social media because... What would happen in many cities is people would go down to the candy store, wait for the paper, and um, and, and socialize and talk to each other, have an egg cream, uh, hang out, spread ideas, talk to people about this, that, or the other thing, or what was going on in the paper. And there were, you know, people who were smart and you really knew it, people who were smart and you didn't know it, and people who were stupid and thought they were smart. That's what I like about the stupid people. They think they're just as smart as the smart people. Exactly. I like mean, me, I'm not a stupid person, but I think I'm smart. Yeah, and and the stupidity prevents you from seeing that you're not. It's it's right. a perfect it's the perfect design, actually. But so now you had, you know, that was the original social media. When you think about it, going down, go down, get me the paper in cities. You know, in the country, it was a bit different. They didn't have the outlet that the cities had doesn't mean they didn't have opinions on things, but it was a different life. It was a simpler life. You stayed in that, you know, your mom cooked dinner, you, you did the dishes. And the goings uh, on in the big cities seemed far away and foreign to them. It wasn't, right. it wasn't their life at all. Right. And then you sat down and you watched uh, TV until 10 o'clock and you went upstairs and went to sleep and you woke up the next day and did it again as Jackson Brown so eloquently wrote in The Pretender. Do it again, do it Get again. Get up and do it again. Amen. Say it again. <laughs> um, so that was the American, That at, at the time Superman came along. 
that was the American dream. And then, it, and, you know, obviously it it went on for 10, 12 years until the 60s. And, and then they decided to get involved in Vietnam. And we saw the American dream uh, at that point was to take our young men and shoot them, have somebody else shoot them, yeah. take our young men and and have them come home with legs missing or arms missing or even most importantly, minds missing. And those who took, took part in that, I was not in the war in Vietnam. Lyndon Johnson tried desperately to get me to go, but I managed to get out. But a lot of guys didn't. And this country is still dealing, ask any uh, group that works with uh, men who are no longer in the military, and they'll tell you that we're still dealing now with the elderly victims of the Vietnam War who have managed to live this long, but never quite got right never quite cleared that that last hurdle of I'm free of Vietnam, never got over it and never will. Well, because we as a society and we did, and listen, I was probably just as guilty of this as anybody. We got to a point where we took out our hatred for the war, for what we were seeing on our TVs every night on, not on the president, although people marched, not on our elected officials, although people voted them out. We took it out on the people that they sent over there. The helpless people. The help, the people that were just told to go and were sold a bill of goods that they were fighting for their country. And against communism, don't forget, the communists were there. Against the commies. And, uh, you know, now people take vacations to Vietnam. Communists are still there, by the way. We're going to have a car in this country uh, next year that is manufactured in Vietnam. Who's that? The VinFast. It's an electric car. There's a uh, a, a multi-billionaire guy over there who's in everything from cookies to you name it. And he's setting up um, shops with this this uh, Vietnamese car. And it's going to be interesting. Uh, you know, I, I thought that there would be a certain amount of people who might not buy into it. Mm-hmm. But how many BMWs do you see on the road? How many Volkswagens did you see on the road? See, people forget. People don't, you know, so I think they'll do just fine if they have a quality car. That's all it takes to, to compete. That's what it were, and, and they can, you know, produce it in uh with uh you know and get it out there and tell it to people see how it holds together and it holds together i mean i don't know i got a pair of nikes that were made in vietnam and they seem to work pretty good same glue they use everywhere yeah so we'll see but the american way then became if the government isn't doing something right open your mouth about it don't just sit there. Or sit there, but make up an alternative version of what the government has done. Make up, your no, own st- make up your own story and believe that instead. Well, that's where, because we all still at that point trusted the government. We trusted that what McGeorge Bundy and and um, uh, uh, Robert McNamara and um, all of those people from the Johnson administration were telling us. We, we, we really thought the only guy that was standing up, as a matter of fact, if you really go back and think about it, the only guy that was really standing up and saying something was Clark Clifford, who I believe was the attorney general at the time. Yeah. Or was that Ramsey Clark? I forget. No, it was Clark Clifford, I think, who, who assembled the, pre- the commission that went, told Johnson, President Johnson at the time, you can't you win this chance yet. Yeah, yeah, God. The only thing chance. you're going to do is send the boys in, and they're going to get. It's like sending them into a meat grinder. They're going to you're just gonna be killing your kids off. And that was the reality from the beginning, Vinny. We never had a chance to win that war, except years before. If you ever watch uh, the the six or seven part documentary on Vietnam done by Ken Burns, yeah, the first episode is the one that got me because the Vietnamese were trying to make contact with the American government 
to say we're under the unfair colonial rule of the French. We're going to revolt and take it and make it our own country. We want you to back us. We want you to help us in our struggle. We want you to finance our, our military efforts because we want Vietnam to be as free as America is. We want Vietnam to be just like you. And we told them to go get bent. Yep. We were back in the French, that the French were the oppressors to the Vietnamese, but they were friends to us. Right. So, so, so screw you and your ideas about friendship. We don't want your friendship. We don't want your admiration. We don't care about that stuff. We're sticking with the French. Next case. So where did they go? They went north to the border. And they said, well, we need a partner. And they and got Chinese one. Chinese have just as many weapons as they do. And in the end. And, and, and everybody else who wanted to see, who wanted that client state. In the end, they drove into town and took Saigon away from us while we were scrambling to get the last vestiges of civilization on a helicopter to get the hell out of there because we wouldn't listen to reality. And when they got the report from Clark Clifford and when they got the status reports as that war went along, every time they learned the truth and they ignored it, their dream was stronger than the way that they should have gone. Well, and, and again, if you go back and, and you listen to Eisenhower and you listen to uh, many people at the time, uh, even some of the Kennedy people who, you know, um, many people in Kennedy's clan thought that the best thing for Kennedy to do, I mean, after he had committed troops, he said, listen, you're, you're going into a, a quagmire here. You're going into a place where you shouldn't go. And he, you know, many people say that he had on his mind that in 1964, he was going to pull out of it. You know... And it's funny that, that, that we had so many chances to fix it and never did. And we bungled and, it. And maybe maybe we still haven't. Yeah, no, I don't think we've completely. Uh, well, let's see. Here's the thing. The American way is to think about it for a week and then look for the next thing to think about. Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're going to have a commission. We're going to study it. We're going to have a report and we're going to move on without ever looking back. And societies that, if you go back and you look at societies that have lasted thousands of years, uh, most 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 likely China, Japan, there's not a 24-hour news cycle there. Those leaders, those people look into themselves and they say, what mistake did we make here? And they take time and they analyze it and they look at it. And they say, how do we make this better? And it doesn't have to happen in an afternoon. Well, one thing they've come to the conclusion of, that one way to make China better is to make one man stronger. And I think that China had an opportunity to become the world leader had it taken a different avenue. But the Chinese way and the Chinese dream were so different from the American way and the American dream. What, what they've decided upon, Vinny, it seems like one strong man with a lot of other people running for the exits. And then what? And then I've got it. And then I've got the control. And then what? And then but, I keep control. Right. But, and, and, and there are people who will say to you, most of them have an R next to their name somewhere. Oh, they love it. That that's the way it should go. That really we need a strong man at the top, uh, um, a Donald Trump, who will listen to the, industrialists and, and shave back the regulations that, that have been put into place and say that the only thing that really counts in America is making money. And me. Me and first. Me. me first. But I think even the money comes before you because if you get COVID, we don't, we can find somebody else to replace you. You know, in China, the, the beauty of the Society, there's they have so many people that if, if, if somebody runs out the door and says, let me get to America, they say, okay, we got the next guy right here. He's put, plug him in. Plug him in now. We'll He's work just, him until he burns out. And then it's a, it's a very, uh, it, it almost reminds me, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Thief with um, Rob, uh, uh, um, Jimmy Kahn and Robert Prosky, but there's a scene in there 
where Prosky, who's a crime boss, uh, and Jimmy Kahn is the thief, and Jimmy Kahn wants to go free. He wants to get away from me. He pulled a couple of scores, and, and, and Prosky has got him um, in an, uh, an acid factory. And he's got his buddy on chains and lower his buddy down into the acid. And he looks over and he's telling him, you work for me. I, I made you. you. Everything you have is because of me. Your car, your house, even your child is me. I got you your child. Because they adopted it. It's uh, Jimmy Conn and Tuesday Weld. And uh, he gives him the speech that you're going to work for me. And when, I, and when you burn out, I'll throw you in that acid vat just like I'm doing with your friend and I'll find somebody else to take your place. And that scene in many ways is said to me what the Chinese government is or some I'll American work you, corporation. I'll, I'll work you till you, till you, till you can't work till your back is broken and I'll throw you in the acid vat. And you'll be lucky to get both. And uh, right. You thank me you'll be out in the field somewhere in some commune camp. Uh, you know, digging up rutabagas. I always mistrust someone who says, in the end, you're going to thank me for this. I doubt that. Well, that's how all those Chevy people got into Oldsmobiles and Buicks. Yeah. So the American way is in danger of changing radically again. Tuesday. On Tuesday, we have, uh, we have an election. And I don't think that the one election is going to change things uh, for the better or for the worse. I do think that if we hand control of this country over to the Republicans, who have clearly shown that they can't be trusted, as, as some Democrats have, have shown that as well, but there seems to be a movement in the Republican Party. Seems to be. Yeah. Okay. Forget about it. There is a movement in the Republican Party to base their to undermine what's left of the trust in this country, what's left of uh, of decency in this country, what's left of civility in this country, in favor of. I call it, uh, and you're gonna, you're probably not gonna like me much for saying this, but I call it the sports radio mentality. Yeah, sports radio sucks enough. It's, it's okay they get that name, but as as they do this, Vinny, they have two things that we haven't had yet in this country, but they're on their way. A new American way, based on a new American dream, and neither one of them am I interested in. The new American way is control, hate violence and, and chaos. Right. The new American dream is that somehow chaos produces this wonderful utopian state where there are no problems and certainly no black people telling you that their lives matter and no Jews bothering you with uh, questions about whether you think is anti-Semitic or not. We'll sweep all that stuff aside. It won't be part of our life. It won't be part of our dream. It won't be part of our way. The American way is bigger and better than that. And if you're white and if you're an angry white guy, we've got a place for you in the American way. And you can realize your American dream. Right. Exactly. Exactly. We we want you if you are. If you believe that society should be dominated by males. We want you if you think that white people. Are the uh, are the rulers of this country that Christian white people yeah. are the rulers of this country, and that this is a Christian nation, Christian nationalists, whatever that means. That we want you that the American way is not going to be uh, 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 equality. We're not all equal. If you got more money, you're more equal. And the thing, the thing you is, also disabled, the, you're not equal. There's no, there's no Christian way anyway. The, the idea that they put the word Christian on their product is very misleading. There's no Christ's belief in it. There's no well, the way of Christ in it. There's no official religious uh, endorsement of it, and there's no way to find the message of the so-called Jesus Christ anywhere in their message. 
Well, and you know, it's interesting, Michael, because, you know, I grew up Catholic. I went to Catholic school. You're still Catholic. And I'm still Catholic. And, but the Catholicism that I learned, the, the, the things that I learned in, in my, my education in Catholic and then uh, the time I went to USF and, and the Jesuits was totally different than what you see out of these evangelicals. It wasn't about come with me or you're going to burn in hell uh, or you, you don't deserve anything. It was, it was, how can I help you? How can I, how, how can I reach out to you and help you? That's why we had hospitals like St. John's and St. Mary's. And because the whole Catholic system was built on charity, was built on kindness. Now, yes, I know people will start bringing up the priests and what they were doing, and that's a horrible part of it. But there was this thing that was that you were taught that was learned in these schools and in religious instructions that Jesus was a kind person. And the only way that you could be in the image of Jesus was to help people, was to turn water into wine, was to make enough bread for the entire community, not just your loaf of bread. I think in many ways, that's why a lot of Italians went into bakeries. Well, they knew how to make bread. Okay, let's give them, let's give them. But, but let's there give was them. This, this thing where you tried to make enough for everybody. If you had, you shared it with people. You had, you gave enough to everybody because everybody should have a piece. If they're, if they're, they're lame, they're this, they're that, whatever, everybody should have a piece of it. And in the sourdough, which the Italians perfected and the French also, you've got that magic. You have to have a starter to get it going. You have to have a starter. And and the and the cook that has the starter can feed the whole village because now everybody can make bread. There's nothing more Jesus than that. Because if you go back and again, I'm talking about the Jesus that we learned about when we were kids. The miracles were all about healing people making sure that people had enough to eat, making sure that people had a place to stay, making sure that you, if, if you had, you gave. And don't forget, Jesus got really wound up one day and threw the money changers out of the temple. He said two words to this effect, what the hell's all this? And he was a, he was a young man at the time. In many pictures, he was blonde, tan, and wearing a perfectly white smock. You have to come to your own conclusions about what it really looked like. He shows up at the temple, the Jewish temple, and there's money changers using that spot to make the, to do their business. You give me five shekels, I give you four drachmas. You give me a, sh sh a shpulpakia, and I'll give you. I'll turn that into rubles for you. Shpaluki. Shpaluki. How many shpalukis in a shpulpakia? Uh, one hundred. So there you go. You got 100. They're, they're rolling across the floor. And Jesus says, I can tell you what we're going to do with your card table, but wouldn't it be easier for me to just show you <laughs> off the door? And, and no one yeah. ever says, boy, did he have the right to do that? Did anyone get hurt? Did Jesus commit a crime? Did he did he punch somebody? Did somebody get a bloody nose? And what happened there? Did, did anybody lose money that day? Was he unfair to them? That never comes up. It's like, it's like of course, he threw them out of the, the temple. You throw the money changers out of the temple. But when you go to the bank and you see them back there counting the money, it never occurs to you, we're going to throw them right out of here. Or it never occurs to you, I'm going to be like Jesus today and clean this mess up. Well, and that's the reason, you know, it, it's so funny because the American way, of course, our system is built on, you know, banking. And you go back and you look at the early banks in this country, the, and and they all looked like temples, didn't they? Yeah, marble. I mean, they were built to look. You go down, you look at the Hibernia Bank, built, uh, the Hibernia Bank down on uh, 
What is market. it, McAllister, just off a of market there? Right, market in New Montgomery or whatever, whatever, somewhere in that. No, no, I'm talking about the, the Hibernia building, which has the columns and, uh, and uh, you know, it's it's it looks like a church. Yeah. And in many ways, that's what uh, the American way was, that money is holy. That's where we worship. I mean, we go here on Sunday, but six days a week we go here. <laughs> And for six days, and I don't know if Elon Musk works six days a week, but one thing he did was he came up with enough billions or somebody gave him enough billions to buy a company that was in the public view, part of our lives to, to some extent, pay a premium price for it, take over violently in, the, in, in terms of the business world. And then when he gets there, what does he do with it? What does he do with his newfound $44 billion company. He tries to make everybody as unhappy as possible. He, who, who are the ones responsible for making him successful at the same time? You're going to be very well, unhappy, but I'm going to be, in the long run, you'll see it my way, I'll be successful. Well, I don't think he's ever going to be successful with Twitter, Michael. I don't think he's ever going to be happy. I don't, yeah, I think that too. Uh, but I also, I truly believe that he has gone, you know, and maybe I'm wrong, but we're looking at a different kind. You know, you go back and you look at the Warren Buffetts, the Bill Gates, all of these people that became millionaires and billionaires, even the, even the Sam Waltons. The Koch brothers. You know, they, now whether you agree with what they give their money to or they don't, or you don't, they tend to take their, their money and try to put it to what they perceive as good. I'll even give the Koch brothers credit. They try to put it to what they perceive as good. Now, it's not what we perceive as good, but, uh, but just the same as George Soros does. You know, politically, you know, that's the lifetimes game. apart, yeah. But the tools, are, there's only so many tools you can, that you have at your disposal to pop up or or finance or encourage other forms of uh, expression. Where's, um, you know, we've seen Bill Gates walk through Africa, uh, set up places where, where they purify water, where they have some uh, minimal type of health care uh, for, for places that would have never had it. That's what he's done with his money. And his wife too. I mean, when they were together, but there's a big, there's a big building in downtown Seattle that houses the Bill Gates, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. But did he send William Shatner back into space this time for real? Right. But what is what is Jeff Bezos, who lives on the other side of the lake there? What does he do? What, where's 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 the Amazon Foundation? He gets t he, he gets T-shirts to you the next day in a box. What what is Elon Musk doing except putting people in Teslas? And uh, putting up an internet service that he can shut off to uh, Spolpaki anytime he wants to. Well, think back to the last corporate setting that you were in and imagine what it was like on one day to have everybody at work. And then you have the same job to do, the same radio experience to broadcast, the same preparedness and the same time that you have to fill. But you have to do it on one day's notice with half the staff. He yeah. fires somebody. Just fires half of half of everybody that works there. Can, could you do a product the next day? Can you issue? Can you be Twitter for one more day, like you were Twitter yesterday? The Twitter of Friday looks a lot different than the Twitter on Wednesday. Well, well, Twitter is a service, and I know you're not on it a lot. I'm on it a lot more than you are, um, because I find it necessary to do it with cars and stuff like that. Businesses that are essentially going to be uh, have to be on there right now are going to be on there. But the individual, it doesn't have to be on there because it's really Twitter, 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 Twitter has turned. I like in. that. I keep it. I like, keep yeah, it. I, I, <laughs> yeah uh, that, that would be your, that would be your porno. <laughs> um, Twitter has turned into such a cesspool of uh, trolls and people that that many people I know are reducing their use 
or getting off the platform altogether. I can't tell you how many people I've seen over the last, I don't know, um, week that have gotten off of Twitter. Now, the corporations and stuff are still going to be there. I'm still going to be there, but you know what? I'm not putting a lot of opinion stuff on it anymore. As a matter of fact, if you want my opinion on something, for the most part, you got to watch this show. You remember when the last election, uh, you know, I was putting stuff up every day. But now, you know, if you want to hear what I got to say, if you want to hear what you got to say, for the most part, you got to listen here. Here's a good example of the difference between the American dream and the American way and how it's changed. Companies are going to remain on Twitter because they fear they need to speak to their people. They need to speak to a wide audience. They need to speak to potential customers. They want to maintain communication. They don't have to endorse any of the other nonsense, like the 40% uh, increase of the N-word usage in just the past couple of days. They don't have to be part of that. They can criticize that, and they can do it on the same platform as the haters use. Right. But that's when you're just participating in a service. If you're a company like the Brooklyn Nets, and an employee makes a point that is so negative and so reprehensible, the company can't allow that to go on. The company says, when you say that, it's like us saying it. I want you to apologize. Not going right. to do it. Well, then what do we have to do? We're a company. You think it's basketball is different from making beer or from selling Chevys? It's not. When the company gets in trouble, we all become very happy, unhappy. So to make ourselves feel better about it, we're not going to have you around anymore. You're suspended. Well, wait a minute. I was going to say I was sorry. Yeah, you didn't well, give, you didn't yeah, give you, me time. Yeah. You didn't give me time. I was going to say, I was going to say it. Now, if you, <laughs> if you, you if, now, if, if you say it, it looks like we forced you to say it. And that's not good for our image either. They said that he was not fit to be a part of the Brooklyn Nets. Now that's, that's a criticism that's pretty damning. We've worked with you. We know you, 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 we, everybody thinks they know you, but we know you better. And you, Kyrie Irving, are not fit to be a member of the Brooklyn Nets. Well, you know, Michael, you see, the problem is, is that everybody thinks that there's free speech in this country. I can say what I want. But there's not free speech in this country. You have, freedom comes with a price. Freedom comes with... I mean, freedom was obtained on the blood of those in the Revolutionary War. It was maintained uh, on the blood of those in the War of 1812. It was fought for for a large part of this country in the Civil War. And you keep going up the line. It was preserved in World War One. It was. It was preserved again in World War II. Don't forget Korea. It was preserved again in Korea. Freedom has to be, has a price to pay. As we've seen, Vinny, it's, it's delicate. For, for fighting over it is interesting, but it, it's a delicate product. And nowadays, we don't go to war as much, but what we do is we have a mechanism to say to you, if you say, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but if you say things untoward, if you have so low a level of class uh, that you go on your Twitter account and you send something out that offends people, that's not free. It's free for you to stand in front of your house and say to people, I hate Jews. You can do that all day if you want. Somebody will come along and smack you in the face. See, I'll see, see where that gets you, but that is your option. That's what your freedom is. Once you go past that one-to-one -one communication, then you're not free anymore. If you go on the radio, if you go on media and you put stuff on there, as I've tried to impress to my daughter many times, what you put on the internet will follow you the rest of your life.
And keep in mind that just because you think that it's interesting to say nasty things about other people, there's a price to that. And if you're not willing to pay it, or if you want to dismiss it by saying, hey, I didn't write that book. I didn't make that documentary. I didn't paint that sign. I didn't carry that placard. What are you, what are you coming to me for? I tell you, you, you guys are just reporters and I'm a basketball player. I will not apologize. I didn't do that. You can, if you want, and, and we're going to have to wrap it up here in a couple of minutes. If, if you want, Michael, you can put anything you want on Twitter. Yeah, that's free. You can go on Twitter. And just because you write on there, opinions aren't necessarily mine. Well, yeah. when you tweet something, you know, um, it's like shooting somebody and saying, well, I don't necessarily have a gun. Also, what makes you think that that endorsement isn't implicit in your action? You sent this information to me. Yes, you did. If you put it up there, you're, I've always operated on Twitter and social media with the province of, if I put it up there, I must have believed it. Yeah. I don't put very many things up there unless it's in the context of, look at this crap. Uh, this is wrong. Now, he didn't do anything like that. He just put it up there. And by putting it up there, it's on his video. It's an endorsement. And remember, he had one, two, three chances on his own to get to get away from this problem. He had two chances when he was summoned by Commissioner Silver. He had another chance yesterday. And yesterday was like the fifth one in a row. And he fumbled it again. And he yep. couldn't say the words, and he was talking nonsense, and he still was still a member of the Flat Earth Society, remember? So he went off the edge. He went off the edge of his own cons construct. The Earth is flat for Kyrie Irving, and he sailed off the edge, and there be monsters. Yeah, there be monsters on the edge. And he's now he's going to be facing them. And believe me, it's not like a... Um, it's not like an NBA defense that he can shoot around. This well, the is problem the, is, my colored, very, colored his career. Yeah, the problem is very simple. If this was Dave DeBusher and Clyde uh, uh, and Clyde Frazier's Knicks, let's say, he'd be the crazy guy down at the end of the bench that nobody really even talks to. He's just got some weird ideas, man. That dude is weird. You stay away from. Don't get caught at bachelor's three with that dude. But now that dude at the end of the bench, and I'm not saying that Kyrie Irving is an end of the bench, you know, as a as a 12th man or anything like that. He'll be lucky. But what I'm saying is, is that because he wears that uniform and the NBA is such a big business now that he has a means to make himself um, heard in a way that that nut job down the end of the bench never did. Never had, never had would. Job down the end of the bench, moved to Skokie, bought a tank, and you know, <laughs> every uh, every couple of you know, every two three months, he you know goes up and down the main street in Skokie. Every Fourth of July, he fires on the hardware store. It, exactly, exactly. Now he has weight, and the media gives him extra weight. Well. All that is true, but he took all that influence, all that power, and all the implied endorsement power that comes with just being a celebrity. And he said, none of that matters. I can endorse these awful films and, and shake, shake the responsibility by saying, oh, I didn't make that movie. I can't be anti-Semitic. I know where I'm from. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> Sorry, can't be anti-Semitic. I know where I'm from. And the earth? Flat as a pancake. And how about you, Kyrie? How are you feeling today? I'm playing basketball. Nothing can touch me. Well, we'll see how long that attitude lasts. It didn't last the evening. By the time the sun went down in New York, he didn't have a job. Yeah, it's. Um, I'm just setting up for this. I got a doctor's appointment here in a couple of minutes. By you. I don't even get to see my doctor anymore. Now I gotta. Now I gotta set up a, a Zoom meeting to see my doctor. Well, we'll let you go to that. I hope it turns out well. This world is getting crazy, Michael. Well, um, Vinny, you and I are still sitting at the end of the bench and no one will talk to us. Well, you know what, Michael? 
Yeah, we sit at the end of the bench, but you know what? People listen to the show. They may not listen right when we're on all the time, but I, I see on Facebook, um, people download it, people listen to it. Um, I think, you know, listen, we don't know what the American way is. The American way could change radically on Tuesday um, or a few days after that when the, the results of the elections are known. I don't know who to believe. I don't know who, whether I should believe CNN at, uh, telling me that there's a, a Republican uh, um, wave that's coming or Michael uh, Moore, who says I that the Democrats are going to eke it out, are going are gonna to hold on, are going to be able to, because abortion is such a big issue that people are, not uh, you know, that people don't necessarily are going to tell a pollster, but they'll go in and vote for freedom. Well, we've seen that work for the Republicans where they got a surprise victory with Trump. I don't think anybody really saw that coming. But the interesting thing is they had to have Democratic voters to make that happen. Now, the, the, the reset, of course, came when Biden was elected. And there's supposed to be another reset now. That's our, that's our cycle. But our cycle is stupid. Because if you're, if you're resetting simply to reset, you're gumming up what was in place to take care of you so you don't have to go through chaos. And what we are uh, offering ourselves in this election is a chance to just dump everything, the Elon Musk way, fire half the government, start different investigations, let Trump off the hook, tell the Department of Justice that they no longer exist, get rid of the Department of Education, double the army and get the generals to work with the politicians to preserve the American power that they've just- And you freeze it up, Michael. All right, listen, you, you back? I'm back. You were freezing up there for a second. Well, you know, Michael, it's, it, it is, it's going to be a very, next week is going to be a very interesting and very telling week for us. We, um, I'm almost uh, thinking that our Wednesday show. Should be Tuesday. Well, no, I think we, we'll cover the election on Monday. We'll have our, I think that we should give the election results before the elections for those Republicans that want to win anyway. And are you know, if you're not going to, if you're not going to believe in the results of the actual election, why don't we just give you, uh, you know, your results the day early? Then he gets them a day early anyway. We can do it on Monday. You got, you, he, 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 in fact, who who is it that passes that to you? The speedy guy from up on uh, Queen Anne? Oh, Yeah. Top of the hill, Daily City. Top of the hill, Daily City. Uh, We're blowing it out to the bare walls. Yes, yes. Bring your wife. <laughs> Wait, bring your wife, your car, and your checkbook, too. Bring your wife, <laughs> your girlfriend, and cash. <laughs> right, your wife and your checkbook or your girlfriend and cash. <laughs> that would be a great ad for a car dealer, you know, like in oh. Vegas. And that's the guy. That's the guy selling stereos and mattresses. I don't know what kind of a store this is. <laughs> Who was the guy? that was the dealer on a peninsula. Used to have that tagline: uh, "Bring your wife, your checkbook, your kids, your dog." For, if you had a dealership in, you know, Bobolinsky Ford in Las Vegas, bring your wife, your checkbook, or your girlfriend in cash. <laughs> do do not. Do not under any circumstances come here without money. Okay, come, come with money, and we'll put you in a Lincoln. Even though you can only afford a fair lane. You're going to buy it and drive it today. You're going to also bring it back in two weeks, and that's not my fault. It's not my fault. Not my fault. And bring lots of money because, and we'll talk about this, you know, the car thing and what's going on in that business because there's a lot of stuff that's going on there where. Chicanery. Well, not just chicanery, but there's, there's a, 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 you know, there's a, what happened in 2008 with the subprimes is happening in the car business now. All, the, all those figures just changed. All, all these people that were given loans and PPP loans and stuff that went out and overpaid for cars. You know, nobody talks about this, but, well, we'll, we'll get into it next week. Well, let's, let's just... Uh, Have a good show tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the morning, Vinny. And we'll... 8 o'clock in the morning, we're going to preview the Seattle Auto Show, which we'll be live at next week. We will talk about uh, the uh, electric truck and we'll uh, go with our good friend Mark Vaughn from Automobile Magazine down to Las Vegas. Speak about Las Vegas, the SEMA show, Las which is Vegas. not to be confused with the Tammy show. 
Um, when the poor people go to sleep with the shade on the light, the poor people sleep and all the stars come out at night, and that's lost wages. Night, baby. I, I just got a, got a tweet from somebody telling me that he had lunch at Musso and Frank's. A suitable, a suitable place for a repast, and maybe even a martini, if you know what you're doing. You, you know, Mikey, when I come to L.A. the next time, which I'm going to hope is going to be fairly soon, um, I want I want to go have lunch. Ever since I saw the Kaminsky method, now okay. I want to have lunch at Musso and Frank's. It shall be done. Hollywood Boulevard's finest, and it's been there since 1923. We'll sit in a booth, and no matter where you sit, a great man or woman or star or starlet has sat there before you. Yep, every, every their DNA, they have, as I like to say, they have farted in that seat. It's true. You have to accept maybe, it. Maybe a little whiff of Betty Davis would do you good. It's part of the American dream, but the chances are, given the uh, confines of the American way, are you going to meet as a rude waiter? We'll know more about the American way Wednesday morning. Oh, boy, will we? And uh, we will be able to talk a lot more about it on Wednesday morning. Let me, before we go, just quickly say, please, folks, if you had did it yesterday, if you have your ballot and it's sitting on your desk or it's sitting in a pile of paper, pull it out, open it up, look at it, do a little research. There's profiles of these candidates all over the internet that you can read. Go to the, go to the ones that are written by the county because they are, or the state, because they are going to be the ones that are most neutral. And look at what they've done, look at what they want to do, and check that box and get your, go down to uh, the library, wherever your drop box is, and get it in. I did it yesterday, Michael. I had what I call the prototypical 2022 day. Makes you feel good. I charged my truck up with electric. I got in it. I went through two traffic circles to get down to the library to drop my ballot in the ballot box. You if exercise. You exercised the American way and you took part in the American dream in one day. Exactly. And uh, I went through a little bit of the British way because that's where the traffic circles come from. <laughs> and they got it from the Romans. Don't forget. Yeah. Romans were big on circles. I don't know why, but. Well, they made these great roads. They wanted people to use them. You needed, a, you needed a, a, the, the wheel was very important. It must, have been, it must have been hilarious to see a, uh, Two chariots like crash into each other. Both with centurions saying, you get out of the way. No, you back up. This is a chariot. You don't back up. You go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm driving. Talk like this. Go, that's, that, that's when you have to talk with both hands like this. I'm telling you to back up, back up, get out of the room. Yeah. <laughs> I'll dump you in the aqueduct, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> See you, Vinny. All right, Mikey, take care. See you uh, Monday if the Lord's will in the creek don't rise. Uh, see the rest of you tomorrow morning. Peace, love, and Manischewitz, baby. What a wine, what a wine. Goodbye. Bye-bye.